I drew near and looked. The coffin was empty. It was certainly a surprise to me. It gave me a considerable shock. But Van Helsing was unmoved. He was now more sure than ever of his ground, and so emboldened to proceed in his task. Are you satisfied now, friend John? He asked. I felt all the dogged argumentativeness of my nature awake within me as I answered him, I am satisfied that Lucy's body is not in that coffin, but that only proves one thing. And what is that, friend John? That it is not there. That is good logic, he said, so far as it goes. But how do you, how can you, account for it not being there? Perhaps a body snatcher, I suggested. Some of the undertaker's people may have stolen it. I felt that I was speaking folly, and yet it was the only real cause which I could suggest. The professor sighed. Ah, well, he said, we must have more proof. Come with me. He put on the coffin lid again, gathered up all his things, and placed them in the bag, blew out the light, and placed the candle also in the bag. We opened the door and went out. Behind us he closed the door and locked it. He handed me the key, saying, Will you keep it? You had better be assured. I laughed. It was not a very cheerful laugh, I am bound to say, as I motioned him to keep it. A key is nothing, I said. There may be duplicates, and anyway it is not difficult to pick a lock of that kind. He said nothing, but put the key in his pocket. Then he told me to watch at one side of the churchyard, whilst he would watch at the other. I took up my place behind a yew tree, and I saw his dark figure move until the intervening headstones and trees hid it from my sight. It was a lonely vigil. Just after I had taken my place, I heard a distant clock strike twelve, and in time came one and two. I was chilled and unnerved, and angry with the professor for taking me on such an errand, and with myself for coming. I was too cold and too sleepy to be keenly observant, and not sleepy enough to betray my trust, so altogether I had a dreary, miserable time. Suddenly, as I turned round, I thought I saw something like a white streak moving between two dark yew trees at the side of the churchyard farthest from the tomb. At the same time, a dark mass moved from the professor's side of the ground and hurriedly went towards it. Then I too moved, but I had to go round headstones and railed off tombs, and I stumbled over graves. The sky was overcast, and somewhere far off an early cock crew. A little way off, beyond a line of scattered juniper trees, which marked the pathway to the church, a white dim figure flitted in the direction of the tomb. The tomb itself was hidden by trees, and I could not see where the figure disappeared. I heard the rustle of actual movement where I had first seen the white figure, and coming over found the professor holding in his arms a tiny child. When he saw me, he held it out to me, and said, Are you satisfied now? No, I said, in a way that I felt was aggressive. Do you not see the child? Yes, it is a child, but who brought it here, and is it wounded? I asked. We shall see, said the professor, and with one impulse we took our way out of the churchyard, he carrying the sleeping child. When we had got some little distance away, we went into a clump of trees and struck a match, and looked at the child's throat. It was without a scratch or scar of any kind. Was I right? I asked triumphantly. We were just in time said the professor, thankfully. We had now to decide what we were to do with the child, and so consulted about it. If we were to take it to a police station, we should have to give some account of our movements during the night. At least we should have had to make some statement as to how we had come to find the child. So finally we decided that we would take it to the heath, and when we heard a policeman coming, would leave it where he could not fail to find it. We would then seek our way home as quickly as we could. All fell out well. At the edge of Hampstead Heath we heard a policeman's heavy tramp, and laying the child on the pathway we waited and watched until he saw it as he flashed his lantern to and fro. We heard his exclamation of astonishment, and then we went away silently. By good chance we got a cab near the Spaniards and drove to town.